Right. In today's video, we're going to go over how to do the initial CTF estimation, which you would want to do even prior to doing template matching. Although template matching doesn't require CTF corrected input, since we nearly always filter by low pass to a resolution lower than the first CTF zero, uh, this initial estimate gives us a good first objective look at the quality of the data and allows us to eliminate tilt series that may otherwise uh, have wasted our time later on. So we are currently in the tutorial data set that we started before in the fixed stacks directory. And there's one file that I forgot to mention as required when I did the initial setup and course alignment with iMod, and it is this one called our prefix tilt1.order. And all this is is a list of angles that represent the order the data were collected in. And this could be anything like a bidirectional from 0, bidirectional from 20, you could go from negative 60 to 60, or do something like the dosimetric tilt scheme. Uh, all that matters is that you list the tilt orders in the order they were collected. So I'm going to show you one way to do it. There's, I'm sure, many better ways. And if any of you have good suggestions, I would love for you to post them so we can include that. Uh, for a bi bidirectional tilt scheme like we have here, one simple way to do it is to open your uh, tilt angle file, tilt1.tilt, in a text editor. And this was collected from positive 20 to negative 60. So I'm going to take the other angles and delete them, or cut them, control X make sure there's no spaces and we want to save this as tilt1.order. Make sure you don't accidentally overwrite your tilt file that has your tilt angles in it. Now we're going to save, make a new file, in this case I'm going to hit control N and paste the values we cut out. And we can't use that directly but what we can do we're just going to save it as temp.txt and we're good to go. So I'm going to close both these. Now, if we print out temp.txt, we could just append this to our other file, but what we want to do is invert the order. So one you can do, you can do that is with the uh, shell command sort. And if we go sort temp.txt, we see they come out in inverted order. Now, if you have negative numbers, you may need to include the G flag, which just tells it that it's numerical input and to treat it as such, and you can reverse the order that you sort things to by including an R flag, uh, which we don't need to use in this case, but just uh, for complete description here. So what we're going to do is we have our tilt1.order that lists our angles from our starting increment 20, which in this case it's 21 because it's the refined tilt angles from the IMOD alignment, all the way up to negative 60. What we'll do is we're going to sort our temp.txt. We're going to do that if we use two little carrots, that means append to. If you do one carrot, it'll overwrite the file. Our tilt1.tilt. .tilt. So all that does is it prints out and oh, yeah, prints out what we had in temp.txt in reverse order, and it then puts it in there. So if we out tilt one dot tilt now we see that we've tacked on these values so we go from that positive 20 to negative 60 we jump all the way back to positive 24 and work our way up to positive 60. so we now have our temp dot text or our tilt one dot order and we can remove temp dot text and it's probably good just to check and make sure given the sort of things i like to do that we didn't screw up the angles in temp dot tilt which we don't all right, so now we have the order of data collection was important for using uh, exposure filter. So we're going to go back, and from our main project directory, we're going to run em clarity ctf estimate, and we want to just give it the prefix for the one we're concerning, which is tilt one, and you'll eventually then do tilt two, and then the last parameter is just to give it a specific GPU. Uh, most of the programs in em clarity divide the jobs up over a certain range or a certain set of GPUs that you give it to work with and it does it automatically. But since we aren't fully into the EM Clarity workflow here, you can specify exactly which GPU you want it to use, which MATLAB index is from 1, or his NVIDIA index is from 0. So I'm going to send that off and we'll wait a minute and get the return. And we get back an error because I forgot to include the parameter file, which is good because in this re-recording I forgot to even mention it. So what I've done 
there is a parameter file that specifies a number of things that we have to define for each project. And we get a copy of that whenever we download EM Clarity. So what you want to do is copy wherever you have EM Clarity installed. In the docs folder, there's something called master param. And you just want to copy that to your current working directory and rename it. So I'm going to copy it here as tutorial.m. And then we want to change that to suit our given project. So we'll go over a little bit what's in the tutorial or in the parameter file. So this can seem daunting at first, but really there's a lot in here that you don't change too frequently. So the first thing is selecting your project name, which I'm just calling Relying Tutorial here. It can be anything you want. There can't be spaces, and it has to start with a uh, letter, not a number. And that's good. I think you can only use underscores in the names. Um, that has to do with how MATLAB treats uh, structures. We've also defined the number of GPUs available to us. On my test rig, I only have one GPU. Uh, if you have more than one GPU, you can specify it as, say, four, and that will select up to four GPUs. Or you can provide a list, like GPUs one and three. The average memory parameter, you're just going to leave as one. Uh, when you get to full sampling late in the process, sometimes you have to change this to two to conserve some memory. But in most cases, you're going to leave this at one. The CTF parameters that we're going to change now are at the very bottom of the parameter file, or just about the very bottom. And the 3D CTF is something that we're currently implementing and is working very nicely, but is not something you would do till later in the refinement stage. For now, we're going to work just with the two-dimensional CTF. So the microscope parameters, first we have to define our pixel size, and everything in the section is in meters and volts. So some people use nanometers, some programs use angstroms, we just like to keep it nice and consistent, so we use SI units. So it's 2.17 angstroms is our pixel size for the data set. It's not a super resolution set, which we'll talk about in a different tutorial. The spherical aberration is 2.7 mils. The voltage used was 300 kilovolts, and the amplitude contrast is anywhere between 0.07 and 0.14 typically. Um, in a lot of papers that I've seen from the Briggs lab, he likes to use 0.1. Uh, it's kind of a hit or miss thing. I just settle for something sort of in the middle. The search range that you use for the defocus is pretty robust errors at this point. Um, other programs are pretty sensitive to using too wide a range, uh, but we're just going to specify 4 as the middle and go plus or minus 2.5 microns with a final cutoff of 9 angstroms. Uh, it automatically determines where the peak of after the first zero is, and then it scales back to the first inflection point from there. It's good to choose a defocus cutoff that includes as much useful information as possible, but not a ton of noise. And you aren't really going to know how that is for your data set until you run it. So around 8 or 9 is a good starting point. You may need to bump that up or down a couple angstroms. The cumulative electron dose is 80 electrons per angstrom squared for this data set. Uh, in our lab, typically, we've been using closer to 100 or 120. And this allows you to maximize the low frequency information that you can use to improve the alignment of both the tilt series and when you want to refine the actual particle positions and the projections, while at the same time preserving high resolution information. And we use the optimal exposure filter that uh, Tim Grant and Nico published. So the bead diameter refers to the diameter of the fiducial markers, which in our case was 10 nanometers. And then there's some astigmatism parameters, which we'll, we'll call those advanced parameters from now. This is a wide enough range that you probably shouldn't have to change it. If for some reason you want to turn it off, you can change that Boolean to a zero. Otherwise, this is pretty robust as well. And for this particular data set, um, I can't remember the number off my top of my head, but it's, it's pretty small, uh, about 100 nanometers to focus, or 100 angstroms, sorry. Uh, the number of workers only specifies in this case when you're interpolating, so we use a spline-based interpolation kernel, which if you're using a super resolution data set, you're probably going to want to limit it because it can get pretty huge uh, pretty fast, but uh, it's not particularly slow even with a few workers, so keeping the number low isn't going to hurt anything. The delta Z tolerance is, in, in our case, 25 to 50 nanometers typically. Uh, that's the change in anticipated defocus that you allow into the averaging, and this usually gives very good results. Um, if you have really low signal-to-noise data, like you're working with thick cells, you may want to increase this, uh, which will give you a lower resolution estimate, but it will give you more power in the signal. 
which is what you would want for that situation. Anyhow, you don't expect to maybe get past 15 angstroms if you've got a 300 nanometer thick cell, which would obviously have to be lysed and milled to be that thin. Uh, these parameters we're not going to worry about in this tutorial, but they're discussed in the documentation. Okay, so that's a brief overview of the tutorial parameters we're going to want to use. And now we'll run that again, except we'll go EM Clarity, CTF Estimate. We'll include the name of the parameter file, tutorial.m, the prefix for the tilt series, and the GPU ID. And we'll check back in a few minutes. All right, now this will have printed out a bunch of stuff to your terminal if you're running interactively on your own desktop. And we'll end with the astigmatism search. So the log files that EM Clarity saves are hidden to create or prevent clutter, which you can show them if you do ls with the a tag. They'll show hidden files which start with a dot. So this is a log file and it contains everything that just printed out on your screen. In most cases you aren't going to probably need to look at that, but that will help troubleshooting if you run into bugs down the road. So first we're going to look at what just happened here. So under fixed stacks, when we run ctf estimate, if it doesn't already exist, a new directory is created called ctf, which we're going to move into. And then a handful of files which are prefixed by our tilt series prefix are put out. So we'll start with the astigmatism.txt, just because we don't need to talk too much about it. This just contains some files and you want to check and make sure it's reasonable. So this was an astigmatism of 37 nanometers, which is pretty small. Um, it's not tiny. In the single particle world, it's actually pretty big. But for tomography, it's not too bad. It isn't really until you start getting up into the hundreds of nanometers that it really becomes essential to correct, and even then it's only going to make a big difference when you're around 8 angstrom resolution. So the other files that we've put out that are of interest, um, instead of describing all these, which I'll do in the docs, I'm just going to show you the most relevant for now, is this psradial.pdf. And what that gives you is a fit of the actual um, theoretical curve, which is here in green, which you can see has an envelope applied to it, and the power spectrum, which is here in blue. Now, we can see that we have very strong signal the whole way out to 9 angstroms, which is where I fit. So that probably means that we actually wanted to include more data. Uh, and one of the reasons we have such strong signals is we've got a ton of ribosomes, which are obviously very strong electron scatterers, and the ice is reasonably thin for the specimen. Uh, for the sake of the tutorial, I'm not going to redo this, but I would recommend that if you were running this on your own project and you saw this high of power all the way out to your limit, I would stretch it out. Now remember, this doesn't this is not linear, so from 9 I would probably go to 7 and see what you get from there. For now, we're going to stick with the value that is negative 3.66 micron as the defocus, and that also created this file that ends with tilt, just like our raw tilt file, but instead of just containing information about the tilt angles. There's a bunch more, which you don't really need to worry about what's in there. It looks like a mess. But this is a precursor to the geometry that's stored in the binary files that EM Clarity uses. So you want to make sure not to edit this, but I do want to point out this li1. So that is going to be prefixed and it can change throughout the experiment based on whether or not you've done any tomogram particle polishing. And for every time you do tomogram particle polishing, that number will increment by one. We'll talk about that in its own video. Uh, but basically, these files are here. You can explore these other ones, which are all centered around troubleshooting and assessing the quality of the fit. But we can see already just from the radial power spectra that things look good. So from there, we've completed the CTF estimation. One other thing happened while we were running that is this new directory popped up called AliStacks. So what that is, is whenever you do the CTF estimation, it is one of the ways that EM Clarity will use to apply the transformations we found in iMod, or later that we were refined in EM Clarity to create an aligned stack. So I'm going to open that at a binning of 2. Well, let's do 4 just to make it quick. And all this is, is instead of now being tilt1.fixed, it's called tilt1 underscore li.fixed. And it's the same tilt series we had, but now it's with the alignments that we had in iMod, which shouldn't look very different because this was already a pre-aligned stack. So now that we've got this file, and you should do this also for tilt number two, we'll be able to move on to actually setting up areas that we want to reconstruct, and from there moving on to template matching. Alright, thanks.